The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Budget Committee will now begin. Good morning. Just sorry, one small difficulty here. My Outlook, my Microsoft Outlook quit on me. Um, welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Budget Committee. My name is Lene Palmasano and I chair this committee. As I get my agenda called up, um, I'd like to note for the record, this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. I will also note that the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the open, the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Reich. Here. Gordon. Cunningham. Ellison. Present. Osman. Goodman. Present. Jenkins is absent. Cano. Bender. Schrader. Johnson. Here. Fletcher. Here. Gordon. Here. Cunningham. Present. Osman. Cano. Bender. Schrader. Chair Palmasano. Present. There are eight members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect. We have a quorum. I do believe Jamal Osman just came in by phone, so I'll give him just a moment um, and then ask him to voice his presence for the record. Today we will hear our final presentations on the mayor's 2022 recommended budget. On the agenda today is the Municipal Building Commission and then an overview on capital and debt. I will first recognize the Municipal Building Commission's director, Aaron Delaney to begin her presentation. Actually, Director, before you do, Council Member Osman, could you voice your presence? I know that you're here by phone. He might still be getting set up. Director Delaney, welcome. Go ahead. Chair Palmasano, I do not believe Director Delaney is in the meeting yet. I, I believe the budget office is trying to reach out to her, uh, oh. but it doesn't appear she's here yet. All right, um, then should we move on to our capital and debt presentation and we can circle back to Ms. Delaney. Um, is Director Kruver ready to go? I know it's a bit early. Yep, nope, that's great. We are happy to go first. Wonderful. Let's do the capital and debt presentation then. Go ahead, Director. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chair Palmasano. Um, I'm going to pass it over to staff here momentarily, but I just wanted to ground us in the work we've done on our capital budget this year. So in 2022 through 2027, our capital improvement plan uh, has six years of capital programming, and in each of those years, we are fitting within the budget uh, that we have set for that outlook. And this is important because uh, in, in some years, it's been typical occasionally to over-program our capital budget in the later years while we are waiting to finalize priorities and finalize levies and things like that. This year, however, we made the decision to produce a capital budget that fits within our levy allowances, meaning that the debt levy that we have in our five-year outlook will support all of the capital projects that you'll see here today. We did that because it's really important that we not add additional pressure to the levy in this year as we are rebuilding, as the economy is bouncing back, and as we have sort of a, a five-year plan to use one-time dollars in a way that's sustainable. So the work you'll see here today, I just wanted to sort of ground us in that. Um, compared to last year's budget, we've, we've shifted 
or eliminated over $200 million worth of capital programming over that six year time period to make sure that we have a, a conservative and responsible capital budget that fits within our debt, um, our debt levy, uh, what that can provide. So that's the hard work that's gone into the capital budget this year. And I just wanted to preface that and thank all of the departments that you're about to see and hear from today for their, their work in getting to this budget. So I think next I'm going to turn it over to Neil Younghands in my office who will talk about the capital process and then we'll hear from some um, experts from the departments that are implementing these projects. So thank you very much and I'll, I'll hand it to Neil. Welcome, Mr. Younghands. Good morning, um, uh, Chair Paul Masano, members of the committee. My name is Neil Younghands. I'm the Principal Budget and Evaluation Analyst in the uh, Budget Office. I usually cover public infrastructure and uh, public works, IT, and the capital program. Um, so for this morning, I'm going to cover the uh, high-level review of the capital budget development process, uh, the mayor's recommended program for 22 through 27, and then uh, the current year's 2022 uh, funding by major category. So if you could go to the next slide, and actually the slide after that. So here's a high level overview of our capital budget development process. The capital budget development process kicks off in February when uh, finance staff send out templates to uh, departments, um, which they will fill out and uh, request projects for the, the next six year cycle. So this coming February, they'll be uh, filling out capital budget requests for uh, projects that will happen from 23 through 28. Um, departments submit those requests back to the uh, back to us back in, uh, in April. Um, and at the beginning of March, we enter the capital long range improvement committee phase of this. Uh, the CLIC is a, a 33 member appointed citizen board with seven at large positions uh, and two members appointed by each council ward. Uh, there are currently 29 members. Um, Click reviews all these department requests and submits a report of recommendations to the mayor and city council. Um, and this work largely wraps up in July with a report that they publish online. Um, for the mayor's recommended phase, the mayor and his staff prioritize uh, projects and submit alongside the operating budget, which is uh, due in mid, mid August. So if you want to head to the, the next slide, I can review the total capital improvement plan for um, the 22 through 27 period. So the total CIP is for $1.126 billion uh, over the six year plan. Uh, last year was the first year where we moved from a five year to a six year uh, um, time horizon. Uh, the purpose of which was to allow for a longer approach to help with planning for projects. Um, in comparison, the total for last year was uh, for $1.28 billion. Um, and this year's program is for uh, slightly less, so that 10%, about 10% smaller. Um, and that is due to programming levels which exceeded rec recommended resources, but also included, which also included a plan to return to normal levels this year, as um, Director Kruber just discussed. Um, over the course of the six year program, we ensure that our financial plan balances to available resources. Um, and in the, as you'll notice, in the 22 through 27 plan, this concentrates investments in earlier years, um, which uh, starts to tail off. Uh, through 2026 uh, when we see a, a slight increase. Um, staff then evaluate the CIP annually and in the 23 through 28 cycle we will either reaffirm that investment needs to be con concentrated or uh, changed or taper off and we'll identify and take advantage of opportunities to spread the investment out. So if you move to the next slide. So in the current year is the only year in which we're actually appropriating cash or uh, authorizing of uh, bonds. Uh, so all the years uh, following are for planning purposes only. Um, in 2022, we include authorization for 56.4 million in net debt bonds, 3.7 million in charter slash CIP bonds, and 78 million in uh, enterprise bonds, which are backed by the water and sewer revenues. Um, also included is $13 million in uh, general and storm sewer, uh, excuse me, $13 million in general fund cash and 1.6 million in storm sewer cash. So in the current year, uh, there's Public Works has 185 million, uh, Public Grounds and Facilities has 16 million, Parks Board has roughly 13 million, uh, municipal, municipal Building Commission is 15 million, and Art and Public Places is uh, 783,000 in appropriation and authorization. And you can head to the next slide. 
And now uh, our submitting departments and agencies are going to cover uh, their own program areas. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary Altman if anyone doesn't have any questions. I'm not seeing anything on the overview. I do want to just voice, um, ask Council President Bender to voice for the record that she's here and Council Member Osmond if he wants to press star six and do so as well. Thank you, I'm here. This is Bender. Thank you. All right, um, I'll turn it over to Mary Altman. Welcome. Good morning, I'm Mary Altman, the Public Arts Supervisor for the City, and I'm here to present on the Art and Public Places budget. Next slide, please. Art and Public Places is the um, commissioning um, area of the city's public art program. It has been funded and in, in the CIP for nearly 40 years, and during that time, approximately 100 works of art have been commissioned. We currently have 90 works in our collection. Next slide. Um, as you know, Art in Public Places is funded by ordinance um, to be a minimum of 1.5% of the net debt bond, and um, that is the amount proposed for 2022, um, which is $783,000. Next slide. Uh, Art in Public Places is guided by six values and goals. Uh, two of those goals are artistic goals. Um, the, first, the first two stimulate excellence in urban design and public art and value artists and artistic processes. The second two goals are community-based goals, including enhance community identity in place and involve a broad range of people and communities. And the last two goals are resource and economic development related, contribute to community vitality and use resources wisely. I'm going to focus on two of those goals during my presentation um, just to talk about the current commissions that we have um, underway, including these include uh, commissions that have been selected for 2022 and the current artists. So um, involve a broad range of people in communities. Our commissions right now really do involve a broad range of people in communities. We're working across the city with a broad range of folks in Curry Park and in Samatar Crossing. We are working on the West Bank. Um, largely with East African uh, residents of the city. Um, although Samatar Crossing does connect to Elliott Park and we are also collaborating with the neighborhood of Elliott Park. The Samatar Crossing project in particular focuses on the history of immigration and the contribution of immigrants to the city. Uh, in East Phillips Park and in the wa in Waterworks Park, we are working largely with indigenous folks. Um, we are particularly in Waterworks on um, trying to highlight the history of the Dakota community at the St. Anthony Falls or Awamni area. And we are working with um, artist Inc. Pamani Thinks First. We have three projects in North Minneapolis, including we just added um, a project in Upper Harbor and we are working in North Commons and we are wrapping up the John Siggers, John Biggers Seed Project over the Olson Bridge. Uh, we are also working with a broad range of artists. You will see from this list that the artists include African American artists, um, uh, an East African artist, uh, indigenous artists. Um, we also in, um, are not just working with a diverse group in terms of race and ethnicity, but also in terms of age and experience. We have artists who are senior citizens and who've been in the field for a long time. We also have artists where this is their first new public art project and the hallmark of the program is the work that we do to really develop the skills of emerging artists to join the field and to continue to do commissions in the city. Um, I just want to touch briefly on a couple of the images. The image uh, of the, the running horse is a lenticular design that has um, been designed for the uh, Green Crescent, which is at I-35 W and Lake um, by Tina Tavera and Javier Tavera. And that will be installed next spring. And also I'm very excited that one of the new 2022 projects is the Underbridge Environment at Lake and Hiawatha, uh, which is a particularly um, difficult um, ugly area of the city that really needs to be lifted up also adjacent to part of the city that was um, um, that 
received a lot of destruction in 2020. And so I'm so glad that we will be working there to try to kind of raise up this area of Lake Street. Uh, this concludes my presentation and I will stand for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Altman? I'm not seeing any. Welcome, Director Delaney. Oh, uh, good morning. Thank you, um, Chair. I apologize. There were technical difficulties. I could hear all of you. Um, so I'm in the meeting. Thank you. I'm trying to remember who comes after um, Ms. Altman. I think you are next. That's um, correct. That's there correct. You Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Ken, are you available to pull up the MBC slides? So if we just go to the next slide, MBC will talk about their capital stuff next. There we go. And okay. then um, after the capital presentation, we'll have Director Delaney present on their operating budget. Perfect, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Council members, Erin Delaney, I'm the Director of the Municipal Building Commission. And happy to share with you this morning the uh, 2022 uh, capital budget request for the agency. <clears throat> Ken, will you move to the next slide? Perfect. Okay. Okay. Just again, some background information that the building itself is owned jointly by the city and Hennepin County. We have approximately 680,000. Uh, gross square feet in the building. The representatives on the MBC board for the city are Mayor Fry and Council Member Lisa Goodman. The county representatives are uh, Chair Marion Green and Commissioner Angela Conley. Um, okay. Uh, Council members, this is our request. Uh, 2022 through 2027, we have five active capital projects. Um, the total request for 2022 is uh, $15 million. And I want to remind the council that this is split 50-50 between the city and Hennepin County. So the city's request is just over um, $7 million. I just want to take a few minutes to review the five projects that we are working on. The first two projects, the mechanical and the life safety project is th these two projects are completed in tandem. And I know that you've, um, oh, next slide. Sorry, folks. Um, these two projects are completed in tandem and um, are part of a 23 building wide project. Uh, uh, building wide, we've divided the building into 23 stages. And the really good news, council members, is that we are now down to the final four stages of this mechanical and life safety update, uh, upgrade project. The final four stages that the MBC is working on is also being co coordinated with the city during your office improvement project. Stage 19 is the southwest corner of ground floor. Stage 15 is the southwest corner of the first floor. And the final two stages, 20 and 21, are the southeast and northeast corner of the third and mezzanine floors. Next slide, please. The work that's included for the mechanical and the life safety MBC portion, life safety work includes building sprinklers and fire alarm system upgrades, smoke detection and smoke barriers. The mechanical work includes renovations and upgrades to the HVAC and the mechanical systems, as well as all work uh, involving um, plumbing and electrical in these same spaces. Next slide, please. The third MBC project is the Facility Safety Improvements Project. And this is life safety work that we're working, that we're doing in the building in unoccupied and unassigned spaces. Due to funding and uh, schedule constraints, the project has been divided into six phases. We're currently working on phase B, 
which is uh, installing fire separations and sprinklers in the buildings for mechanical shafts. This work involves uh, is starting in the attic area and we'll be moving all the way down into the sub basement area. I've laid out the remaining um, pieces of, of this work. We, uh, the MBC, are prioritizing um, fire sprinkling and fire alarm uh, upgrades as part of this project. Next slide, please. The fourth project that the MBC is actively working on is the 4th Street reconstruction sidewalk enhancements. As the city completes the 4th Street corridor project, the MBC is taking advantage of this time to make some upgrades to the 4th Street side of the, the building. The sidewalk itself is wider, and this picture depicts that we will be installing additional flower and shrubs and trees, as well as the addition of 10 to 12 granite benches along 4th Street, as well as upgraded and uh, safer uh, bike racks will be installed along 4th Street. The final design is still being determined. Um, the benches serve as a uh, as twofold. They will increase safety and security on the sidewalk itself, and they will uh, promote um, use of the sidewalk. And our hope is that um, more people will come outside on a nice day and sit on those benches. The current benches that we have are often filled. And so we're hoping by allowing uh, more opportunities for communities to gather that these benches will be used. Next slide, please. The next active project is a building wide electrical systems upgrade. This is a new project. We're requesting funding for 2022 through 2024 and it, the work includes replacement and upgrades to the three, uh, the building's three electrical services. Um, again, the current systems are beyond life expectancy and quite frankly, subject to failure. So this work will be concentrated on uh, upgrades to the panel boards, the circuit breakers and conductors, and will again bring the building up into compliance under the National Electric Code. Next slide, please. A reminder to the council that the NBC's capital projects focus on stabilizing and supporting the operations of the building and result in operational dollar savings. Again, a reminder that all capital projects are split 50-50 between Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis. I'm happy to answer any questions at this point if, uh, if there are questions on any of the capital projects. Are there any questions or comments for Director Delaney? on this part, which is just the capital end of the MBC project. I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, I know, I believe we're moving to Mr. Arvidsson from the MPRB. Is he here and ready to go? Yep, looks like you are, welcome. Uh, thank you, um, uh, commissioners. Uh, sorry, council members. I'm used to saying commissioners in my role at the park board. Um, my name is Adam Arvidsson. Uh, I'm assuming that this is going to be my presentation. I just want to make sure that that's correct, that I am next. I think it looks like Kirkwood Jones is up. So that would be Barbara O'Brien. Um, and then I think you're after that. All right, I'll see you in a moment. Sorry about that. That's okay. Hi, Ms. O'Brien. Welcome. Good morning and thank you. Good morning, um, council members. Uh, my name is Barbara O'Brien and I'm the Director of Property Services for the City of Minneapolis. And I'm here to highlight some of the projects that we have on our capital budget program for the years 2022 through 2027. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, currently, these are the eight projects that are listed in those years um, for the, our capital program. Uh, I would love to, as you can see highlighted um, um, in the blue is the current 2022 program and I would love to talk more about these projects. Next slide, please. Uh, for the purpose of presentation, I have actually 
done a combination of the projects um, from slide to slide so that it would be easy to discuss them as functionalities. In this case, the Minneapolis fire stations altogether. There are three of them currently on the listing. Fire Station 11 is a replacement uh, and relocation of the existing Fire Station 11, currently at 20, or 229 East 6th Street to a future location. Uh, we currently have targeted 935 Fifth Avenue as uh, the relocation site for this fire station. Um, I would just call to attention that this project is in its early stages of pre-planning and programming. And um, so we are hoping to advance this for the course of the, the programmed years as reflected on the previous slide. Um, the site that we are focusing on for relocation is City of Minneapolis property. Fire Station 12 is the replacement of the by existing Fire Station number one. Um, this is well underway. It is uh, located at 530 South 3rd. Uh, it was originally built in 1908, and then we, the city, remodeled it again in 1963. So it has um, served the city very, very well over 100 years. Currently, uh, we are in partnership with Sherman Associates Development, and they are uh, developing the block and currently building a new fire station for us. Uh, it's well underway. Um, it will have, it will be two stories and it will have three apparatus bays. It's right around the corner from its current location. And upon completion of that fire station, uh, expected in the spring, um, the old fire station will be demolished and be part of Sherman's development plan, which will offer market rate housing as well as low income housing in that area. Fire station 14 or FIR 14 is the replacement of fire station number 19. The project is also currently in a very early pre-design phasing. Uh, this would be a partnership with the University of Minnesota. They are hoping to acquire the property where the fire station is currently located. They have development plans for that area and we are um, beginning the negotiations and pre-planning for, uh, for what a new fire station would look like in that same area. Currently, it is located on Ontario Street, which is just south of the uh, university's football stadium and uh, areas that we are looking at and talking with them include areas that are just around the corner, just east and or west of the stadium. So very infantile stages of planning, but uh, we want to make sure that the, these projects are included in our six-year program. Uh, next slide, please. Again, just uh, keep just grouping the functionality areas. Um, the next two uh, on this slide represent MPD D04, which is the replacement and relocation of the existing Minneapolis Police Precinct 1. So uh, currently we are in very early phases of uh, finding a new location for Precinct 1 to be relocated within the precinct boundaries. We have started um, conversations with the developer and uh, are hoping to have uh, to advance this project over the Q1 and Q2 of, two, of 2022. Um, so that we may bring forward some contracts to uh, move this project forward. Um, MPD D06 is a study of our current facility uh, pictured on the upper right hand corner of this slide, uh, formerly known as Third Precinct. Um, uh, and so we, Property Services currently has this property and this facility under a st stabilization. We maintain it at a level to not um, 
allow for further degradation of this property while decisions are being made. There is a line item in the budget for uh, that will allow property services to do further studies, further consideration and continue to stabilize this property. Next slide, please. The City Hall Restack Project, Director um, Erin Delaney uh, uh, touched on this a little bit uh, from her perspective. This is very much a partnership with, um, with, our, with the Municipal Building Council and we uh, work hand in hand with them as we realize some of the uh, needs for the city. We call it the City Hall Restack Project and we continue uh, through these phases. This project as it relates to property services has been broken down into three separate phases. So PSD 20 is a three phased approach. Phase one is the lower level of the southwest portion of the facility. We are um, wrapping that portion up and our staff, city staff will be moving back into those spaces very shortly. Phase two is the first floor and second floor. Um, it includes fire, the fire department and um, property services as well as MVC and MPD on that floor. And we are well underway in construction at that phase. Phase three are the upper floors. So the third floor and the mezzanine level. We have recently finalized a contract with our A&E firm World Architects, who will be guiding us and partnering with us through the development of the final phase of this project. Next slide, please. Oh, I, I will actually just wrap that up. Uh, we do have up two other projects that are on our, on our overall um, listing, capital budget listing. They include animal care and control, um, as well as a training center that um, that would be in, included with the Hiawatha project uh, that we are still underway and um, in planning phases for. I will stand for any questions and thank you for hearing this presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments for Ms. O'Brien? I know we tried to really condense all of your slides. You maybe <laughs> have a few others that you thought were there. Um, yes. I want to mention that Council Member Schrader is here for the record and ask him to voice uh, his presence. And then also you may have a question or comment. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am here. I didn't have a question. Just wanted to let you all know that I'm present. <laughs> thank you. And you were he was um, here at the very beginning of the presentation too, I just um, should mention. Um, all right, then we'll be transitioning over to Mr. Arvidson. Thank you. There we go from the NPRB. Welcome. Hello, everyone again. Uh, thank you, Council Member Palmasano. Uh, my name is Adam Arvidson. I am the Director of Strategic Planning for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Uh, in that role, I do craft the Park Board's Capital Improvement Plan. Um, we do also a six-year CIP. Um, and then I shepherd that process through the city's uh, uh, coordination with the city through click and through presentations like this. Um, so if we can go to the next slide today, I want to give some background on how we create the MPRB EIP because our process is just a little bit different internally. Um, many of you may know that uh, we use a system of racial equity metrics um, to select projects for inclusion in the neighborhood capital uh, improvement plan. Um, these metrics came into effect along with uh, the NPP 20 agreement with the city in 2016 and 2017. 2017 was the first year that we used equity metrics in the CIP. We have seven equity metrics and they include both community and park characteristics. And what's unique about this is that uh, we had the first CIP in the nation that actually used community characteristics empirically to select projects. Um, so we're not looking at um, just the asset condition in the parks. We are actually looking at the uh, community and neighborhood need around those parks as part of our decision making as well. So under the community characteristics, we use four metrics, the racially concentrated areas of poverty, um, also known as um, ACP50s. Um, we use population density, 
youth population, and then also neighborhood safety statistics. And under the park characteristics, we are looking at the lifespan of the park assets in the park. So um, is, a, is a playground beyond its useful life or is it within its lifespan? We look at the condition of those assets. Those two things need to be considered separately because um, uh, sometimes in, in higher use or denser uh, parts of town, uh, the condition of an asset may be low even though it's in its lifespan. So we look at those separately. And then the last one uh, is a proportion of value or a historic investment. We uh, prioritize parks in which there has not been investment in the past 15 years. So that's on a constant kind of rolling basis. We can go to the next slide. So each of these metrics, um, uh, every park is scored under each of those seven metrics and they get a maximum uh, possible points that you can see here. Um, you can see that we are prioritizing overall the community characteristics, which makes up more than half of the total. Uh, and the most important characteristic we're using is that racially concentrated area of poverty or ACP50. Because um, these are uh, neighborhoods that have been underinvested in the past. Um, and so we prioritize investment in those parks first. Next slide, please. So the scoring of the parks on that on all those seven criteria, we uh, we rank all 152 neighborhood parks, uh, whether they have major recreation assets or not. We recalculate the underlying uh, data behind those metrics every year. So that's part of our CIP process. So right now we're just going through our budget process for a 2022 and onward CIP for which we are using our new uh, brand new 2021 ranking. And then parks are brought into the CIP based on those equity rankings. Um, parks that have higher rankings are prioritized and they come into the CIP first. Next slide, please. Um, so after the passage of the NPP 20 agreement, I mentioned back in 2016, 2017, MPRB chose to transition its CIP rather than wipe out the entire CIP and use equity only. So we preserved projects that were already in the CIP, thereby keeping the promise to the community that had been made in previous years. But the additional NPP 20 uh, money allowed for more projects to be brought in each year. But what's what's uh, interesting to talk about today in this particular year is that 2022 is actually the final year of the transition to a fully equity driven CIP. It's, it's actually the first year of an equity only CIP, though we do have four free equity projects that were uh, previously delayed that are still in the CIP. But I think from 2022 onward, we will see projects selected um, only through our equity metrics uh, and no more pre-equity projects in the CIP. So it's, it's a great milestone. We're five years in um, and we've been able to make some major investments um, uh, in areas of the community with a lot of need. Next slide, please. So very quickly with our projects, um, there are many, many, many projects that we do uh, in any given year. And these are often grouped into, um, into categories um, or kind of larger kind of uh, roll up projects. So the big ones to think about are the park CP, which is the capital infrastructure. These are um, projects in parks uh, at amounts of about $1.1 million or less. So this is when we're doing um, a major renovation of a park, but it might be a six or $700,000 investment. The park RP is the rehabilitation program. There are 10 categories that are used throughout the city as needs arise for rehabilitation. This is repaving of courts, um, sidewalks, roof repairs, um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning in our 49 recreation centers, things like that. And then we have some general projects that have to do with playgrounds, uh, pools, and athletic fields. Next slide. Um, and in addition to those, uh, working through the click process, there's been a request to look at these uh, at our even bigger projects individually. So we do have single park projects and you can see the list of those there. Uh, I'm not gonna read them to you, but uh, those are the ones that uh, whose budget exceeds $1.1 million. These projects and actually all of our park CP projects use participatory project scoping, meaning that when there's an allocation here, say at uh, Farview Park, we have a master plan for all of our neighborhood parks now. We look at the master plan, we look at the budget, and then we go talk to the community about what their priorities are in that park. And they may tell us, we'd really like to have a new waiting pool here as a top priority, uh, and then we work that into the project. So we do engagement very close to the implementation of these projects in order to find out what the community priorities are at that moment. Next slide, please. So here are the hard numbers um, in the mayor's 2022, which reflects the MPRB CIP. 
you can see the largest numbers here are in that um, those park CP and RP numbers, the capital infrastructure and the rehabilitation program. And then you can also see some of the standalone projects getting funded, such as Bryn Mawr Meadows. Um, that's actually the second allocation for a major um, uh, athletic field replacement project, as well as a lot of neighborhood amenities showing up in there. Um, and you can see our ongoing playground program. Playgrounds constitute our highest use facility and also the one with the highest risk to the public and to the park board. So we invest regularly in those playground projects. Next slide, please. Um, a couple of quick maps. Um, uh, here's a, a project list for some of those um, uh, site specific projects. Uh, and you can see how they do cluster often in the upper south and in the north. Um, uh, those again is a reflection of the equity metrics at play. And the next slide shows another map of our um, Park CP projects. So these are the big but not so big implementations. And again, you can see them uh, clustering in the north and upper south and then starting to move over into northeast as we uh, move through the equity rankings. Uh, next slide. So my final slide, I just want to make a quick note um, uh, of information and also to offer a great uh, word of thanks to the city for uh, working with us over the past year to make an increase in the NPP 20 funding over the next five to six years. And I want to tell you how uh, we are putting that into uh, this year's budget CIP, the draft of which was just presented to the Board of Commissioners last Wednesday. I just want to let you know how we um, are currently intending to use those increases. So because this is really um, an, a, an adjustment according to uh, inflation and cost of projects continuing to go up, we have looked at all of the projects within the neighborhood CIP and primarily given them additional funds each year to reflect that year over year in base, year over year inflation. So we didn't add a whole bunch of new projects. We instead um, uh, really made sure that those budgets are reflecting realities on the ground. So there's a standard six year escalation that's been included in our CIP for equity projects in 22, 23, and 24, and then 5% annually after that. Some of the projects like those remaining non-equity projects and also our play area rehabilitation projects were not inflated. Inflation was already included in the play area ones, so we're not doing that again. The remainder of the additional funds were then put into our rehabilitation, specifically in the ADA improvements category, the general building rehabilitation category, and the neighborhood amenity fund. Those three funds are really the, in a way, the, the bread and butter of what we do. It's recreation centers, it's how are people playing in the parks, and it's how does everyone get access to those parks safely. These funds also allow the greatest flexibility and implementation across our system. And it allows us to use more internal staff, you know, and, and expertise in order to get that work done, which is often quicker and more efficient than contracting all of it out. That amounts to an annual rehabilitation fund increase year over year, de depending on the other projects that ranges from about 300 to $800,000, uh, again, depending on the year. Um, that is my last slide. Uh, so I'm happy to stand for questions as others have done if, uh, if council members have any. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Arvidson? I'm not seeing any. Thanks for joining us this morning. Next up, we have Director Jelly from Public Works. Welcome. Thank you and good morning, Chair Palmasato and committee members. My name is Brett Jelly. I'm the Interim Director of Public Works. And thank you for the opportunity to present the Public Works portion of the 2022 to 2027 capital program. Uh, our program is, is expansive. So um, we basically, it's organized in six areas transportation, sanitary sewer, stormwater, drinking water, fleet and off street parking. And I'll go through each of those areas uh, and uh, give highlights. Uh, we have about 50 funded uh, programs or projects in 2022. Next slide, please. So the first area that I will uh, give an overview on is our transportation uh, area. This is the most expansive of, uh, of the categories, covers capital investments in streets, uh, bridges, signals, in many other areas. And even within the transportation uh, larger area, there are some subgroups that I will uh, go through quickly. So next slide. The first 
area is uh, active mobility, sidewalks, bike, and pedestrian projects. These are high impact uh, standalone projects focused on uh, on these types of, uh, you know, either active mobility, sidewalk improvements, uh, bike and ped projects. The next slide gives uh, a little bit of uh, an idea and the image of the types of things we will do um, in this program uh, and includes um, extending uh, sidewalk uh, corners, uh, adding mid block crossings, uh, this area includes our um, Safe Routes to Schools program, uh, pedestrian safety protected bikeways, uh, and Vision Zero as well. In 2022, we have some projects where, um, for example, in near North and 16th Avenue, we'll be doing a project and we also are able to use the city funding to leverage uh, federal funding. So the project I just mentioned will include a million dollars in, in federal funding. Next slide. Second area in transportation is our bridge program. Uh, we do annual bridge safety uh, reports to uh, based on federal and state mandates and calculate our sufficiency ratings and uh, evaluate bridges and that guides our annual uh, and long-term program and funding. In uh, 2022, we have um, $700,000 in our uh, major bridge repair and rehabilitation program uh, and then just note some projects that are funded in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, image on the right is an example of what the type of work we do in the major repair and rehab program. Uh, we'll be working uh, finishing the Bloomington Bridge uh, in 2022. And again, I'll note um, future year projects include some um, significant projects such as Nicollet Avenue South. Cedar Lake Road, Bridge 9, and Pillsbury Avenue. And we are, of course, getting very close to finishing um, a very large project this year, which is the 10th Avenue Bridge Rehab. Next slide. So our paving program um, is uh, has 27 capital projects or programs over the six years. Uh, there are 14 capital projects and programs funded in 2022. Next slide. Uh, with the 54 million million dollars of funding in 2022. We're planning to improve over 30 miles of streets. Uh, of course, as I mentioned um, earlier and highlighted the specific active mobility bike ped projects, uh, when we reconstruct streets uh, or do asphalt and concrete rehab even, um, we have uh, a lot of opportunities to make those types of improvements as well. Uh, an example is in the picture of a, of a uh, uh, island uh, in the middle of the street for pedestrian safety. Uh, some highlights in 2022. We'll be starting uh, the $20 million Bryant Avenue project that's going to be constructed in 22 and 23, and we'll be finishing a $17 million project Grand Avenue uh, um, in that next year's construction season as well. Next slide. Actually, Director Jelly, can you just help us understand the difference on the previous slide um, between residential reconstruction and street reconstruction? Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, our street reconstruction projects um, are these, you know, a standalone um, uh, projects where usually um, some uh, length, many blocks, uh, very um, involved from a, a community outreach standpoint. And residential reconstruction, we we had some uh, identified some needs over the past few years. This is a relatively new project, uh, our capital funding program, where we're able to go into a smaller area um, that, you know, it might be a block or two that uh, there's um, serious soil problems and that area just needs to be um, uh, your typical mill and overlay or kind of heavy maintenance isn't adequate and we're able to um, have a program that can address that smaller reconstruction project. Thanks. Also in the transportation group, our traffic control and street lighting program, there are eight capital program areas, uh, 10.7 million in 2022 
and over $68 million uh, programmed over the six years. Uh, I'll pause. Council President Bender. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I do have a question on this slide. Do you want to finish so that I can ask when you're done? Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council President Bender, that works for me. Uh, so on traffic control and street lighting, um, as I mentioned, um, the eight capital programs, if we go to the next slide, uh, this type of work, uh, this program supports work um, around adding accessible pedestrian signals and countdown timers, um, bump outs at new signals uh, when we're working on a signal system, uh, it includes pedestrian level lighting. Um, we have, uh, again, this is a, a program where we have some success in leveraging outside funding. So for example, in traffic safety at Hennepin and Harmon, we'll have, uh, or have federal grants um, to improve three of the five intersections in 2022. Um, then I'll pause. Yeah, Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. Director, you and I have talked about this, but I'm getting a number of complaints from my constituents about traffic lights that are um, broken or not functioning. Um, so street lights, excuse me. So the street lights that illuminate the street and sidewalk, not the traffic signals. Um, and it, it sounds like there's a, a list of about 600 broken um, lights. I think you mentioned in, in committee that that isn't an unusual number, but I am hearing an unusual number of complaints about it. Um, just both from a traffic safety perspective as well as a personal safety perspective. And I wondered if this is a, a resource problem. Um, do we not have enough staff to fix the lights or resources allocated to this? I do think there is a number of reasons to want our, our uh, street lights to be working. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Palmasano and Council President Bender. Yes, yeah, so uh, street lights, that's a, um, a combination of, of two things as far as keeping that system um, operating. The first is on our operating budget, which we presented um, earlier this week, uh, noted that in going into the 2021 budget, when we were we took reductions uh, across the department. That is one area where we um, needed to take some reductions. It is also an area that we are proposing to add funding back. Uh, so that's uh, more on the maintenance side and the ability to respond. And you know, if a light's um, just burned out or there's a smaller electrical issue, uh, we can respond. Um, we also are looking at um, other opportunities. I think we're hearing. Um, um, from policymakers and from the public and, and, and doing, looking at ways to put more resources into responding to that. And then uh, within this presentation, you know, this is long-term kind of capital and being able to replace um, our systems um, as we're able to. And um, I think, you know, I, of the two, I would say the, um, our operating budget side is probably why we're we're um, feeling um, or hearing from more people, and it's that, again, that's certainly an area that we're we've are um, uh, adding some budget back because we would like to respond more quickly. Uh, I will keep going. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and one more. Uh, now moving out of transportation and into utilities. So this is an overview of our sanitary and stormwater capital programs. There are four sanitary sewer capital programs and seven stormwater programs, um, all of which uh, for the most part are, th are kind of ongoing capital maintenance type of programs. The next slide will focus on um, our sanitary uh, program. So this is um, of the two, maybe the um, less complicated. We um, own and manage 
the collection system um, in the sanitary side and take it to uh, Met Council system for eventual treatment. So our, our kind of primary um, needs here are making sure that the system is in good repair and functioning. Uh, and then the other kind of big area is to limit the amount of clean water uh, that gets into the sanitary system because ultimately if, if you have, for example, rainwater going into the sanitary system, it, it goes to Met Council for treatment and uh, that's um, something that we like to avoid. Uh, the images kind of give an example of um, what a, a substandard or failing a sanitary line looks like and then the type of uh, repairs we can make. Uh, the, the lining program is very effective. We don't have to dig up streets. Uh, it also prevents uh, that clear water from getting into a, a, a sewer pipe. The next slide focuses on the stormwater uh, system. This one has the same infrastructure needs. So we have pipes in the ground that we need to make sure are uh, functioning and in good condition. Uh, the stormwater system has additional needs though because it is one of the areas in public works where we feel climate change uh, most acutely. The chart on the right shows just the um, kind of the frequency of heavy rain over time. You can see that grows and that puts pressure on our system. And that shows up in a couple of ways that can show up in um, street flooding, but it also can show up in uh, underground um, performance of our system. And for example, uh, pressurizing uh, our storm tunnels causes infrastructure damage. And so um, to respond to that, we are in uh, the second month of a three-year $58 million project, the Central City Parallel Tunnel, um, that will give uh, water more space uh, as, as we uh, take it from the streets and from the surface and ultimately to the river. The other item in this area, um, is a regulatory uh, aspect where we have stormwater permits and we um, invest money in on the capital side to make sure that rainwater is uh, is meets um, regulatory requirements as it's conveyed to our streets, uh, lakes, and rivers. Next slide, please. Uh, in drinking water, we have a number of. Uh, capital programs uh, projecting almost um, close to $40 million in 2022. Again, uh, a lot of kind of ongoing infrastructure work that happens in the system, both at um, our treatment plants, which have a lot of facilities, as well as treatment infrastructure that needs ongoing care and maintenance, uh, as well as uh, the distribution infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, work uh, includes uh, the, the image to the right, which I chuckle at, uh, is a fire flow test. So uh, this is when we are testing uh, the performance out in the distribution system and using uh, a data informed approach to uh, uh, plan cleaning and lining projects. Um, this uh, we are investing more over time. Again, uh, this came up during our operating budget conversation as well on the distribution improvements and plan on investing more over time. It's nine million dollars this year. It grows to twelve million dollars. Um, and uh, knowing that we want to put some uh, more focus on how our distribution, uh, the maintenance of our distribution system. And then my final slide combines uh, fleet and parking. So on the fleet side, as a reminder, uh, Public Works manages uh, the acquisition, uh, maintenance, and disposition of all uh, city fleet. And there is some uh, capital infrastructure that goes with uh, supporting that. The fuel and charging stations. Um, charging stations is a relatively new ad, um, but as I've uh, talked in front of council a number of times about our Green Fleet goals and charging is a very critical component to that. So we have money identified and programmed to support that. And then um, the other thing I would just note is motor pool management system. As we uh, do our best to 
maximize the efficiency of the fleet and um, and technology is allowing us to maybe get back into the pool car um, environment, uh, especially downtown with electric vehicles, which would be a very, uh, you know, maybe the goal is to reduce our fleet count by using it more efficiently. And finally, off street systems, this is just identifies uh, the need to invest in things like elevators and pedestrian doors, um, the items in our in our off street system. This is we've been reducing that uh, capital investment over the last few years, realizing that um, the pandemic's impact on on parking generally. And with that, I will stop and uh, happy to answer any questions. And is it true, Director Jelly, that the Traca key is actually a management system for those, for people who are using different, like keys for vehicles, so to speak? Uh, Chair Palmasano, that is correct. Um, it is secretly the last line. Yes, Traca key. Uh, it is secretly uh, harder than you might think to keep track of uh, keys in an 1100 person department. Yeah. Thank you for this presentation. Um, are there any questions or comments? Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I appreciate um, so much the opportunity to spend more time on the capital budget. So thanks, you, thanks to you for making that space and time and getting into this detail. I often comment that there's basically no, you know, comment or discussion of our, of our capital program. Um, when we're voting on our budget at the end of the year. So I just want to make a couple comments about public works and how I think our policy work is showing up in this um, capital program. Um, as you all know, we've been working together for many years to do a significant amount of public engagement about our city's transportation system and generally our infrastructure system and how it can these investments can be used to further race equity and climate change goals or not. And I think we've made huge progress as a city of leveraging the millions of dollars that we spend in infrastructure each year to meet our city's goals and that it will be really important to continue to intentionally do so in the future if we are to make that progress. Um, using so much, you, you know, so it took quite a long time to develop uh, the vision, vision Zero Action Plan, the Transportation Action Plan, and that was the result of careful data-driven um, research into traffic safety, um, into our um, flooding systems, and our water systems, and all of these pieces of the puzzle that go into our city's right-of-way and infrastructure. And so now, um, as we're developing the five to six year capital program, all of those metrics are feeding into deciding which projects to focus on using a race equity criteria. As far as I know, we were the first city in the country to use race equity criteria in programming our capital dollars, um, inspired by the park board who um, uses that model and had started to um, before we adopted that practice. Um, you know, we are focusing, as this presentation showed, resources in those high crash areas of our city and leveraging infrastructure dollars to improve our system and the safety of our system for all users as we're reconstructing roads for maintenance purposes. The one piece that I think is important is um, that going forward, uh, we, we are still you know, not making as much progress as needed on some critical items like our ADA compliance and upgrading our ADA ramps. Um, and while we have made significant investment in maintenance of our crumbling infrastructure, um, there's still need to advance the work around safety and sustainability. And I know that our staff had a, some conversations with policymakers about potentially finding funding sources, especially for that ADA compliance work um, that wasn't quite, quite ready to move forward for this year, but is a continued need in our city and one I hope will be um, revisited for future budgets. So I just want to really commend Public Works for taking so much time over these last several years to be so planful, to be so responsive to all of the community engagement that was done 
I remember the word cloud that um, came back in the early stages of the Transportation Action Plan. Councilmember Reich and I in the mayor's office um, helped guide that process. And you know, transit was in the middle in giant letters about what we were hearing from community about um, the needs and desires for our transportation system. And I think we were really getting there with our capital budget. Um, so I just um, know that that is the result of you know, so much work from so many staff uh, across the Public Works Department, from the folks who play on the system to the folks who build it. And I just want to thank your team, Director Jelly, for all of that, which is showing up in this presentation. Uh, Chair Palmasano and Council President Bender, uh, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you and I uh, would like to recognize Jenny Hager and her team uh, and the rest of the division directors who do a lot of uh, a lot of heavy lifting throughout the course of the year to, to get to this point. So thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments on public works at this time, so now I'm going to transition over to Alan Hopp. Is that right, Director? Chair Paul Mazzano, I am um, Alan Hoppe, Director of um, Banking, Investments and Debt. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that, Mr. Hoppe. And um, to the um, committee members and council members, I appreciate the opportunity to talk over debt here a little bit today. Um, first off, I'll point out that I report to the Chief Financial Officer, Dushani Dai, and I'm replacing Mike Ablin, who retired in January. So I'm on a learning curve here, but uh, I think I can kind of cover the basics here. One of the things before I get into the four slides we have here that I want to mention is that the, um, and some of you have heard this, but um, this past week, we did get an improvement for the bond rating agencies, um, an improvement in the outlook from both Standard & Poor's and Fitch rating services. So that's uh, kudos to city staff, council members, um, everyone involved with the um, discipline, uh, financing and transition that happened in the past year. Uh, for the rating agencies to recognize that um, the, city, the city has um, maintained a steady course of good discipline with finances and the, um, the path forward looks, looks good from that standpoint. So those kind of elements do make a difference in the bond rating and the bond rating does affect interest rates um, that the city pays on debt, but it's also a reflection of the overall health of financial health of the city. The, um, as a, a side note, of course, um, Standard & Poor's rates us as AAA and um, we have a stable outlook. This, of course, is um, slightly better than how they rate the government of the United States. Um, that um, that's noteworthy. The city has a little more flexibility than what the federal government has. So that's kind of a big picture. Um, the um, directors preceding me have talked about their different capital projects and of course um, serving as kind of the internal banker for the city. Uh, my role is uh, to take these numerous projects and as they're teed up to start writing checks um, to go forward into the financial markets and issue bonds uh, to fund these long-term assets which are typically paid for uh, through revenues, um, system revenues, or uh, property taxes. Generally speaking, about um, uh, half of our debt is uh, funded through property taxes. The other half, what kind of system revenues? You have utility revenues. We have special project, special assessment projects, which are um, repaid uh, by the benefiting owners. So that's kind of just some background information. With that, I'd like to um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll draw your attention here to the far right column. We list the various uh, debt types that we have out there. 
and this shows a change um, over the course of about 17 years or so, so quite a long period of time, but you can see that um, over that time, our debt balances um, been well maintained. And when you factor in inflation, the fact that the debt has really not gone up much. In this particular comparison, it's gone down quite a bit. Uh, but we'll look at another chart and you can see that it hasn't gone up much. It's been relatively stable in total. The um, bottom of the center column there, you see a grand total of geo debt for 2021 of $792 uh, million for the different categories. I'm gonna go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, in this case, uh, the far left column is a repeat of the one we just saw there for 2021. Just that's there for reference. And so when we look across, um, for example, in this case, the enterprise fund, we show the balance 284 million. Um, principal payment coming up here in 2022, um, about 39 million, interest about 8 million. And so you can kind of, I won't go through each uh, line item here, but that's the, the nature of this particular um, table that we have here in the total. Um, is down the bottom. Actually, the bottom line shows the different totals. The um, <clears throat> one category I want to highlight right here is the third uh, line down, uh, typically referred to in with with uh, many folks here as uh, net debt bonds. Um, I um, kind of summarize that just for clarity. That's solely tax supported debt. And so on the far right, we have um, 2022, a total of um, about 57 million uh, coming up here for debt service in 2022. If we can flip to the next slide. So in this particular slide, we see some history. It doesn't go back to 2004, it go back, goes back to 2011. And this is where I was saying that Basically, in recent times, our total debt outstanding has been relatively flat in that. Um, in this, you look here, you can see there a range of about 700 to $800 million. And so that far right column in 2021, that's uh, that 0.79 uh, billion or 790 million. That's the same number we've been seeing here in these prior slides. We can go to the next slide. Mr. Happy, could I just pause you for a second and call on Councilmember Goodman who has a question or comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a question. Nice to meet you, Mr. Hoppy. Um, and maybe this is in your slide and I jumped in too soon. The number or the amount of outstanding debt is interesting, but I need to understand it in context. Um, so could you tell me in terms of our debt repayments, what percentage of our budget is comprised by just simply debt repayment? Is that part of your slide presentation? Uh, as far as the total city budget, it is um, not part of the presentation here. Do you have an estimate of the, I, when we have to spend money on paying back debt, we don't have money to spend on programs. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, is it 10% of the budget? Is it up in the 15% range again? I don't have a good sense of what percentage of our cash is going to pay off debt and thus can't go to other projects. If you don't have that answer offhand, um, I'm sure other council members would be interested in that answer later th this week. Uh, yes, council member Goodman, I'll have to get back to you on that. And the budget um, staff may have a little better handle on that since it's relative to the total budget. Yeah, I'll move into calling on Director Kruver if she wanted to add anything. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Palmisano, and for the question, Councilmember Goodman. Um, I can get you the the overall city income compared to debt payment. Those two numbers, I think, are, are typically what we reference. So I'll get you those exact figures. But I know um, just off the top of my head, for after reviewing this information this morning, that when you look at our levy, so just looking at the property tax levy that we collect, our debt levy is 14% of that specific overall income. And that is that goes to net debt bond. So there certainly are other um, monies that go to pay down debt related to utility funds um, and things like that. So I'll get you that full picture. But I know if you're just thinking about that levy, it's about 14% of our total levy. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm also interested then in um, whether or not 14% is high as an average around cities around the country or low. I would guess it's not terribly high since our bond rating was just renewed. Um, but I think of debt more like an obstacle to spending money on programs. And so I'm always very sensitive. Those who've been working with me for a long time know I'm super sensitive to tax increment debt and adding on to that uh, as well as uh, you know, bond, ta property tax-based debt through GEO bonds. So I would love to just get that information offline. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoppy, turn yeah. it back to you. Thank, thank you, um, Chair Palmisano. If we could uh, flip to the next slide. Uh, this gets a little bit to the levy question or um, details. So we got two lines here. The, um, the top line reflects a historic basket of city debt uh, levies. The bottom line reflects um, the past library levy. So going forward, that the proceeds uh, from that uh, library levy are basically combined with the city's numbers um, to fund the debt service. So here, and um, we saw on some of these previous slides, if you look at 2021 or 2022, you can combine the 47 and the 10 that you see below there, and that gets you roughly to that 57 million of tax supported debt that we have coming up here in 2022 for the levy. Um, and that's kind of just a very basic uh, overview of what we um, have out here coming up for the debt service and the picture of the kind of debt that we have. Uh, again, this um, uh, presentation um, gets to debt, which is a tool for financing long-term uh, projects uh, and that's uh, how we go about this whole thing. We collect, we, we go through all these projects that you've seen from all the different directors, work with them on when they're going to spend the cash and then go forward and, and sell the bonds. Uh, we're trying to be careful not to sell bonds before they're needed, um, uh, but be sure that we show up with the money when it is needed. Uh, and it's relatively low cost. Um, in the sense of uh, interest rates, our tax exempt bonds, uh, which just sold yesterday, uh, were um, netting 1.4%. Uh, and the, there were some uh, small amount of taxable bonds and those sold uh, for around two and a quarter percent. So uh, the city is um, well regarded in the investment community, given that we're um, very highly rated uh, relative um, to um, other cities, I believe we are very <clears throat> well positioned for the amount of debt. Granted, as a large city, we have a little more capacity, uh, but I'll point out that um, a good portion of our debt is paid within 10 years, um, and more, more than half of it. So typically um, we are in a good position and we are uh, reasonably aggressive, uh, but using good public policy uh, when it comes to financing long-term assets with long-term debt. Granted, some of these projects also receive infusion of uh, dollars from other sources to fund the capital projects. Um, Chair Palmazano, that's the basic uh, information for this presentation. Thank you. So at the end of this part of the presentation, are there any big capital debt kinds of questions or conclusions, kind of the broad picture um, from my colleagues? I hope that this is um, a, a good way for us to improve on and, and kind of see all the capital and debt stuff together. Um, it, it is different than we have done it in years past, but I think it helps uh, to show more clearly, here's what we're spending our debt on and investments in, and it helps to kind of weigh those and see those in context with one another. So thank you. Um, thank you, everyone that just presented. I will ask the clerk to please receive and file that presentation, and then we will go back to the NBC presentation. We have Sheila Delaney with us, and um, we'll ask her 
to go ahead and go forward um, with the MVC's regular presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Uh, again, Erin Delaney for the uh, Municipal Building Commission. This is our 2022 operating budget request. Um, some of this may sound a little repetitive because I just spoke with you about our capital request. Um, again, the uh, City Hall Courthouse building is jointly owned by the county and the city and managed by the Municipal Building Commission Board. The MBC's role is to provide a functional, safe, and efficient building and work environment for all city and county employees, as well as members of the public. The MBC staff have the advantage of serving as the first point of contact for all visitors and employees in our building. And it's our goal to establish a welcoming and inclusive atmosphere for all. The MBC offers monthly tours currently scheduled for the third Wednesday of the month. And in addition, MBC, MBC staff is always happy to provide uh, different tours on different days. So please contact the office if we can schedule a tour for you. Next slide, please. This is a copy of the organizational structure for the MBC staff. The um, top box of the uh, chart lists the MBC board membership. And as a reminder, state statute designates that the president and the vice president of the MBC board will be served by the chair of the county board and the mayor of Minneapolis. The remaining two members of the MBC board are designated by both the Hennepin County Board and the Minneapolis City Council. The next part of the uh, organizational chart lists that the NBC has five, uh, NBC operations have five leadership roles. We have administration, security, and human resources. And we have project managers dedicated to both the capital large new projects, as well as the regular maintenance projects. Next slide, please. A little bit more of who we are and what we do. The MBC operating budget has five business lines. The first operating business line is our administration. Administration staff serves the MBC board and implements all board directives. The second business line is our custodial and our security teams. The custodial team is charged with keeping a clean and safe uh, City Hall Courthouse building. And I'd like to publicly call out the MBC custodial team for their excellent work in the last two years. On a very short notice, they became absolute experts in uh, cleaning practices and sanitation to um, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the facility. So um, elected officials, please, uh, please continue to support the MBC custodial team because their work is just very high level. In addition to our outstanding custodial team, we have MBC security team that monitors um, all entry points and hallways with the use of cameras and uh, continuous building rounds throughout the facility. Our MBC security staff currently staffs the 4th Street security desk and will also be staffing a new security desk that will be located at the 5th Street entrance of the building. MBC security staff is available on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next slide, please. The third business line of the MBC is our repairs and maintenance program, and this includes both our capital new construction projects as well as our operational maintenance projects. Both projects are budgeted through this uh, repairs and maintenance. The fourth business line is the Adult Detention Center. Reminder that the um, Hennepin County administers a 509 bed jail in the building on the fourth and fifth floors. MBC staff does service this facility. All expenses incorporated and built into the ADC are paid 100% by Hennepin County. The MBC does not contribute to this business line for the MBC. The fifth business line is what we call work for others. And this is uh, an opportunity for individual departments to make 
uh, remodeling requests that fall outside the regular uh, maintenance considered for the MBC and all project costs are paid directly by the individual department that makes the request. So those are our five business lines. Next slide, please. This is our proposed budget for 2022. This budget has been reviewed and approved by the MBC board and calls for a 1.6% increase over the um, 2021 operating budget. This proposed budget maintains the same level of service into uh, 2022 that was offered in 2021. The operating budget is split 60% paid by the city and 40% paid by Hennepin County. Uh, this proposed budget complies with both city and county financial guidelines. Next slide, please. And you can see that um, again, this proposal maintains current service levels and complies with the city's directive of a property tax amount of $5.5 million and a local government aid amount uh, for a total uh, of $235,000 for a total city cost of $5.8 million for 2022. The total operating budget is the amount of $9.7 million. This was a quick review of the MBC operations. I'm happy to be available for additional questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions or comments. I appreciate that Councilmember Goodman and Mayor Fry serve on um, the Building Commission and um, are to continue to track it closely um, through those meetings. I'm not seeing any questions or comments okay, for you, thank you at this time. So thank you for this presentation. I will direct the clerk to file this presentation on the MBC. And seeing no further discussion at this point, I'll let my colleagues and the public know that our next meeting is scheduled on Tuesday, November 16th at 1.30. This is going to be the first of three public hearings on the mayor's recommended budget and the only public hearing that will be held at the budget committee. The remaining public hearings are scheduled at meetings of the full city council scheduled for December 1st and December 8th, both at 6.05 p.m. I will also note for my colleagues and the public that we have our budget markup session scheduled for Friday, December 3rd at 10 a.m. This meeting is intended to deal with the bulk of budget amendments. We also have a meeting scheduled for December 6th to deal with any cleanup work before this committee sends its final recommendations to the full council for adoption on December 8th. Are there any questions on the budget process as I've laid them out? Not seeing any. So with that, we've concluded all business to come before budget committee today. And without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you.